Baptist Church. It's great to have you here this morning. Let's go ahead and get started, if you would. Let's take out our hymn books and turn over to hymn number 159 this morning, hymn 159. Tell me the story of Jesus. Once you find that, go ahead and stand with me here. And let's sing this out here today. Sunday morning, I can hear myself singing, which is not all that great, and then I can hear the choir singing, but I can't hear you all singing, and so uh, this morning, I, I think it's a little bit more exciting if we tell the story of Jesus like we actually mean it, isn't that it? It's an exciting story that Jesus Christ came, he died for us, he saved us from our sins, we should get exciting in the morning, can we say amen to that? Amen. amen, so let's try again on the third verse, let's try to pick it up a little bit and sing it out like we are excited about telling that story on the third, here we go. Tell of the cross where they nailed him. Tell of he suffered my pain. Tell of the way where they laid him. Tell how he lives once again. Here we go. Tell me of Jesus. Tell me again. Tell me of Jesus. Tell me the story again. On that last. Tell me the story so morning. I want to thank you for coming out uh, to Cross and Crown Baptist Church this morning. If you're joining us uh, online as well, a special welcome to you uh, for tuning in to our service here. It's a privilege uh, to be able to have those that type of technology to be able to meet the needs of those folks who are not able to come out here this morning, so we welcome you here as well. If you were come, came here and you did not get a welcome packet, I want to make sure that that just gets into your hand. Is just a little bit of information from our church as well as a connection card here. You can fill out as much as you feel uh, comfortable filling out and then just drop it into the offering plate. That way we have record of your visit. So if there's anyone here who did not get one of these, if you would just slip your hand up real quick, we'll make sure one of the ushers in the back get, just make sure he gives it to you. Remember, um, members, this is for you as well. If you need to connect with myself or Pastor Caldwell, uh, just fill this out. Make sure you write down what you need to connect with us about, and we'll try to get in touch with you as soon as possible, okay? All right, there's only a couple announcements here. We've got some things coming up over the next couple months uh, that we'll be rolling out into the bulletin, letting you know some of the events coming up here. Um, a couple big ones that are coming up is we've got uh, summer camp coming up here next week, July 15th through 20th. All the teenagers and myself and uh, my wife and Pastor and Kim, as well as another uh, sponsor is going down with us to summer camp down in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, we're taking off next Sunday morning, right after the morning service. Uh, we'll be driving down there. We'll spend the night down at Cross and Crown Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. And then uh, Monday, we'll get all registered into the camp, and we'll be coming back on that next Friday. So uh, for a whole week of camp there, July 15th through 20th. Uh, so that's coming up. So church, would you keep us in prayer, please? Start praying now. Uh, pray now specifically for 
keep praying for safety. I know we're not on the road yet, but let's ask the Lord that he would protect us as we go down. I also would ask, would you pray for our teenagers that they would hear from the word of God and have tender hearts to hear? Uh, that's why we're going down there, not just to have fun, but to have a time where they can hear from the word of God, they can have their lives impacted by God, and uh, to come back changed, to come back on fire for him. So that's coming up next week here. Uh, with that in mind, right after the evening service tonight, uh, I need to have a quick uh, summer camp meeting with all the parents and teens, okay? This is just a quick uh, little bit of information to update us on some packing information, uh, what to bring, that type of stuff. If you have any questions, uh, this is the time to ask me so that we're all on the same sheet of music when it comes to summer camp. Uh, you can see coming up also August 5th is we got a special missionary coming in, uh, Joshua and Melissa Booth. They're our missionaries to England. We support them here, and uh, they're back on furlough, and they'll be coming in to update us on the work that they've been doing there. They've been doing a great work for many years there, and uh, we're excited to see what God has been doing there uh, and the investment that we've made uh, to see the souls that have been saved and the churches planted there. So come back. Make sure you put that into your calendars August 5th. That'll be a special Sunday. I asked Brother Ed if he would come and open us up in a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray. Brother Father, Lord, thank you for giving us the privilege to gather together, uh, to sing praises unto your name, uh, to hear your word spoken to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would um, prepare our hearts, uh, Father, to, to do those things today. Help our hearts to be encouraged, uh, Lord, in, in our walk with you. I pray that you bless every aspect of the service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. paid the price with his own blood. It wasn't something that we had to do. We couldn't earn that, but he paid the price. And that song it, it, uh, is a recollection of the story there, the Philippian jailer, who at the end of his, at the end of his rope, at the end of uh, everything, had gone completely bad. He was about to take his own life. And uh, he asked the question, what do I have to do to be saved? And somebody had the answer for me. They said, believe 
on Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And that's our job here today, to tell that to others around us. Let's go ahead and take out our hymn books again. Let's turn over to the chorus 591, chorus number 591. Let's sing the chorus, He is Able. Then we'll take some time and welcome everyone to the service. Go ahead and stand with me. Sit down here. one of the service. are looking, keep, please keep in, uh, in prayer Pastor Caldwell and his family. We're looking forward to having them back here sometime this next week, I suspect. Um, they haven't given me exact day that they're traveling back, but I think they've got to be back here Friday or Saturday, one of those days. I think Chris has a test he has to take, so uh, with them being up in uh, northern Maine, that's going to take them two days to get back at least. Uh, and if they take any stops along the way, they may need to take off uh, three days beforehand. So I suspect either Tuesday or Wednesday they'll start making their way back, and that's just a very long trip. All right, uh, I don't know the exact mileage of it, 30-some hours, 20-something. It's, it's crazy up there. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So please uh, keep them in prayer as they start heading back, and uh, we'll, we'll be looking forward to having them here. Um, we mentioned it. It's not in your bulletin this week, but I did mention it last week. Uh, last week was the first week that we had rolled out our new Cross and Crown app, okay? And uh, with technology as it is, we've tried to keep up to date with that. And it's just another tool that we have uh, presented here uh, to allow you to connect with our church. And if you want, haven't been able to download it yet, many have have. I've already seen that there's a lot who have have it on their phones already. Uh, just go onto our main website, and right on the main page, there's a button there that you can download it. And it will download right there. If you have your phone, it'll send you right to the page to download it. If you're on your computer, it'll send you a text message with the link in it, okay? And so on it is just a great way to connect with events, with uh, prayer requests. There's a prayer wall there. If you have prayer requests that need uh, prayer for, please don't hesitate to uh, send that over. I will try to be looking and keeping that up to date as, as quickly as possible so that everyone knows. Um, I know we have a uh, Cross and Crown uh, prayer page. 
but not everyone has Facebook. And so this allows uh, everyone to be able to see those prayer requests as well and pray for it. So if it's unspoken, just put unspoken and we'll keep you in our prayers with that. Um, there's just a lot that that app can do. So if you haven't had a chance to, to check it out, go ahead and download it and you can check it out there as well. Um, if you're, uh, as well as we get ready to take our offering tonight, that app allows for what we also rolled out last month, our online giving. And if you're not prepared or able to uh, give with cash or anything like that today, this allows for online giving and for those who aren't able to be here when they're traveling, it allows you to keep up with tithes and offerings that we often forget about. And so they're just tools that you can use and allow us to connect and, and unify us as a church here to, together. So let's go ahead and have our guys here to this, this morning and we'll take our offering this morning. Thank you for all those who faithfully serve in our church from week to week. There's many are in this building that you don't see maybe here in the sanctuary. And that's because they're all in the back, they're working, they're uh, watching the doors, keeping us safe, they're working with our kids, and uh, I want to say thank you very much for all those who are, are faithfully serving our church. Brother Kevin, welcome back from off the road, and would you go ahead and uh, pray for us this morning? next song, uh, number 160 in your hymn books. I long to worship you. Here's our opportunity to sing unto our Lord, 160, my Jesus, I love thee.
third verse, let's slow it down just a little bit. Think about the words as you sing, will you? All love the in life I will if you would, to Genesis, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37 here. We're going to start looking at this story here of a man in the Bible who went through, went through some pretty hard times in his life and see how he responded to those here today. And as we, um, I put up on Facebook last night just uh, this picture here that you see here, and I asked, what do you think that we're talking about? And most folks were saying freedom, and we are. We're talking about freedom again this week. Last week we talked about that freedom wasn't free. Well, this week we're going to be talking about freedom, but in a different way. And so I'll, hopefully you'll understand where we're heading with this here uh, as we get into the book of Genesis chapter 37. Let's go ahead and start reading here. We're going to start looking at the beginning of the story. We're not going to cover all of it by reading it because uh, his story, we're going to look at the story of Joseph here, and his story covers probably uh, five chapters, six chapters. Um, really, he's one of the, uh, out of all the men in the Bible beside, in the book, I should say, out of the men of the Bible in uh, Genesis, um, Joseph, his life is covered uh, almost the most. Abraham is covered a lot. Uh, but then really we see a ton that's talked about Joseph. And it's interesting that you see his entire, almost his entire life story and uh, the, the troubles he went through and how he responded to that. And really this is uh, something that I think in our life um, we all struggle with. And something that as we talk about here today um, really will, could hinder our walk with God if we're bound up by this particular um, topic that we're going to be talking about here. So starting in 37, verse 2, let's get into this story. It says, Now these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and, the wife, and, and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his uh, brethren saw that his father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, ye were binding sheaves in the field. And though my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance, or homage, okay, to my sheaf, or to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him and said, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for the, his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he said unto his uh, father and to his brothers and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come, down, uh, come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father observed the same. 
And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, uh, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out to the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, and said, What seekest thou? And he said, I, I'm seeking my brother, and tell me, I pray thee, uh, where they are in feeding the flocks. And the man said, they are, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when he saw them afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath, hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid uh, him out of their hands, and deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors, and that was on him, and they took him, and they cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and, and, our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Joseph! Had a loving family, didn't he? Had kind of a disjointed family. His father, Jacob, had four wives, and um, that caused a lot of conflict in his family with all those brothers. Uh, J Jacob also made the mistake of showing some favoritism to one of them, to Joseph. And his brothers hated him. And here we have the beginning of Joseph's life. He had a dream by God. He had a disjointed family, but God said, I've got, a, I've got a destiny for you. I've got a great plan for your life. And Joseph, just imagine you had heard from God about the future, what your future was going to be, that this is what was going to happen. Well, naturally, he wanted to share it. Naturally, that's exciting. Hey, I know what God has for my life. But his brothers didn't find it quite as exciting as Joseph did. And they betrayed him. They stabbed him in the back. You say, oh man, I've had some hurts in my life. Man, Joseph, talk about being betrayed. His brothers hated him so much, the Bible says they couldn't talk peaceably. That's where it started. They couldn't talk to him. Then when they saw him coming, they're out far away enough from home, they, th they said, this is our chance. This dreamer, let's see what happens if we take this into our, hand, into our own hands. And they said, we'll kill him. We'll just get rid of him. They hated him so much, they were willing to, to kill him. Well, one of his brothers was a little nicer. Reuben said, oh, let's, let's not kill him. You know, I want to stay in, in dad's good graces here. I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll, he, Reuben was the oldest. And Reuben said, I, I'll, I'll become the favorite. I'll save him. And so he said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him into a pit. That, that wasn't even all that much better. But they threw him into the pit. Reuben goes away for lunch or something and comes back. And all of his brothers have been talking. And they said, they see this caravan heading down to Egypt. And they say, well... You know, it doesn't help us if we kill him. We, we just have a guilty conscience of killing somebody now, and it didn't help us out. So I know what we'll do. We'll sell him. And so they sure enough did. They, they haggled the price and sold him down, and he's now jo Joseph is heading down to Egypt. We don't have time to read the rest of the story here, but let me just tell you the rest of Joseph's life. He gets down to Egypt, and he becomes a slave in the house of Potiphar, who's the chief captain of the guard. He's the keeper of the prisons. And he gets down to their Potiphar's house, and you think about this, this is, this is pretty bad for Joseph. His, he's far from his family, he's been betrayed. Everyone that he cared for and loved have turned their back on him. And now he's in Potiphar's house, and he works hard. He does what's right. And he slowly gets promoted, and finally Potiphar sees him as a man who is trustworthy. Finally Potiphar sees Joseph as a man that can be trusted and says, you know what, I'm going to make him the head of my house. And what he does is he's the chief steward now. And so everything that Potiphar has, Joseph 
has record of it. Joseph is in charge of. And he keeps track of it. And he keeps track of all the other servants. He's the top servant. He's still a slave, but he's in a position of authority now. Well, Potiphar didn't have a very good wife. And she set her eyes on Joseph. And here he is, everything's going okay for him. He's still a slave, but it's going okay. But then Potiphar's wife comes along. And she wants Joseph, and she wants to commit adultery with him. And Joseph says, no, I'm not going to do that. And the Bible says that day after day she came and she tempted him. And he said, I'm not going there. And the Bible says that there was a day when he was alone in the house. And all the servants had left, and she came and found him, and she tried to tempt him. And she grabbed a hold of his garment. And the Bible says that Joseph, he was a man of integrity. He ran. And he says that he left his garment, his outer coat. He left it there with her. He just fled. He got out as quick as he could. Well, you know what they say, a woman scorned. She didn't like that. And so she turns around to her husband and lies about Joseph and says, He tried to assault me. And Potiphar, I believe, knew that that wasn't the case. But the Bible says that he was angry, and I think he had to save face. And so Potiphar throws him into prison. He could have killed Joseph, but he threw him into prison instead. And now Joseph goes from being the favorite son to being a slave, to being the top slave, to being a prisoner. These aren't nice prisons either. These are dirty, these are dark. They're stinky, they're wet, and he's in prison for years. He gets into prison, and again, he responds the correct way, though. And the Bible says that he is promoted again to the top prisoner. We'll just call it that. I don't think there was a position, but they're like, okay, you're trustworthy, you're the top one, you know? You take care of all the prisoners. They made up an a, a, a area that he could serve in there. And as he's in there, he finds two other prisoners. There was a butler and a baker. And these are some of the chief officers of Pharaoh. And they got thrown into prison. They, they, they had uh, displeased Pharaoh. Maybe uh, one of them had made the bread the wrong way, had made it too crunchy or something. I don't know. But he got thrown into prison. And, uh, and the butler had gotten thrown in. He must have been a part of making it too crunchy. I don't know what happened. But they're both in prison. Okay? It's not good for them either. And they have these dreams one day, and uh, they have these dreams of one, the butler, he has these baskets of bread on his head, and uh, so many baskets there, and eventually the, the, the dream is that he ends up being hun, and the, the, the butler has a dream, though, and he has a dream of being put back into service. And so Joseph comes along and, and says, I can interpret what these dreams mean. So he interprets it for them and says, hey, here's, here's basically what your dream is, Baker, the, bat, the butler, here's the good news. You know, in, in, in this amount of time, you'll be restored into your position. You'll be serving Pharaoh again. It's all going to be good for you. The, the uh, baker's getting all excited like, yeah, that was a good dream. Uh, what's, what's mine mean? And so Joseph says, well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is I know what your dream means. The bad news is in a couple of days you're going to be dead. All right? That's just how it is. So he tells those dreams, and sure enough, it happens. As he gets ready to head out, as the butler is getting ready to be put back into the uh, position of, of, of service there for Pharaoh, Joseph comes to him and says, Would you do me a favor? I got thrown in here and I didn't do anything. Would you mention me to Pharaoh? You would think, the butler, Oh yes, you've just told me, you've just answered my dreams, you've helped me out. This is, this is going to work. In a couple of days, I'll get you out. I'll, I'll mention it to Pharaoh. And it's a strange verse in one of those in the chapter there. I believe it's... Um, Chapter number uh, 44, I believe it is, or chapter number 43. As he gets out, the Bible says that the baker, or the butler, forgot Joseph. Think about that. He gets out, he probably got excited, he was probably getting used to his life. But think about that, the person that had helped you out. Joseph had invested, Joseph had helped him out. So just, just do me a favor. I don't need anything special. Would you just, though, mention me to Pharaoh? See if you can help me out here. And for two years, Joseph was left in prison. Man, you talk about feeling stabbed in the back all over again, right? Talk about another hurt that has been added on to his life. Well, sure enough, Pharaoh has a dream. 
And now Joseph's destiny is fulfilled. Pharaoh has a dream and it bothers him and nobody can answer what his dream is. And then all of a sudden the butler, oh yeah, I know a guy. Oh, I left him in prison. Oh, can you imagine that feeling when you remember Joseph? Oh, I knew there was something I was supposed to do. Hey, Pharaoh, I've got a guy. He can answer your dreams. And they bring him out of prison. He's told the dream and the Lord gives him the interpretation of that dream. And now Joseph finds himself having gone at the age from 17, a, a life of hardship after hardship after hurt after hurt. He finds himself at the age of 30, a second in command of the entire nation of Egypt. He, it, was a, it was a pretty amazing destiny that God fulfilled in his life, wasn't it? But there was a lot of hurts in the meantime, weren't there? There was a lot of hardships. And Joseph, time after time after time, had the choice to either forgive or to get bitter. See, we all get stuck with that decision in our life because we all have hurts. We all have issues. We all have things that people have done to us to wrong us. And we're stuck with either this decision. We're stuck to either forgive or we're stuck with the decision to get bitter. See, bitterness, it's simply that feeling, that deep seed of, of, of anger or ill will because of, of a perceived hurt or a real hurt. And maybe you say, oh, well, Brother Matt, I'm not bitter here today. We don't like to use that word because it sounds too strong. Oh, I'm not bitter. But sure, if you ask me about that person... I can quickly remember every little single thing they've ever done to hurt me. I can quickly hold on to it. I have that feeling of ill will towards them. You know what that is? That's just bitterness that has taken root into our hearts. See, we all have wrongs. We all have hurts. You say, what are those hurts? One of the best definitions that was explained to me, uh, Brother Jim Shetler, who is uh, the dean of men out at West Coast Baptist College, he put it this way. That wrongs and hurts and betrayals in our life are simply, they're a violation of our inner justice system. We all have a justice system, don't we? We all have a system inside that says, you know what, this is right and wrong. And this shouldn't be allowed to happen to me, right? We all have that inner justice system that says, hey, I shouldn't be treated this way. And sometimes it's right and sometimes it's off. Sometimes we have too deep of a justice system where we take every little thing as an attack against us. But when we apply it to the Bible, guess what? When we have a justice system that lines up to the Bible, guess what? There are times and things that happen in our life that are hurtful to us. Folks, can I just help you out? There are going to be hurts in your life. There's no way you're going to get through this life never being hurt or betrayed by somebody. Because we live in a sinful world. We live in a sinful world with sinful men. And sinful men hurt people. What we do have the choice, though, is how to respond to those hurts in our lives. See, today I want to talk about the freedom of forgiveness. See, forgiveness, bitterness in our life is one of the greatest hindrances to your walk with God. It's one of the greatest tools that the devil will use to destroy your family is bitterness. It's one of the greatest tools that the devil will use to destroy our churches is bitterness. But if we're going to forgive, we're going to have to understand what forgiveness is. Then, Let's take a second. Let's open up in a word of prayer here and then we'll get into the message here today. Dear Father, we thank you for this time, I ask that you would just please guide and direct. I ask that you would please just be with me as we go through this. Would this be something, Lord, that helps us? And Lord, it's been a help in my life through the hurts and uh, the wrongs that I have felt have been done to me at times. Lord, I pray that you would instill this truth into our hearts on a daily basis. Lord, help us if there's anyone here today who is holding on to those hurts, to those betrayals. Whether they are real or perceived, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they find freedom 
in their forgiveness. And Lord, we ask that you would guide and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. What is forgiveness? There's a lot of definitions out there today. There's a lot of ideas of what it means to forgive. I think there's also a lot of misinformation about forgiveness. It's one of those issues that we throw a lot of little catchphrases out there. One of them that's popular we'll mention here in, in a second is forgive and forget. Well, is that true? Well, I think as we'll see here in a minute, I think it's a little bit deeper than just throwing out these catchphrases. But let's see, what is forgiveness, what it isn't? First of all, forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't overlook or agree with a sin, but rather it confronts it and acknowledges the sin. You say, what do you mean by that? Sometimes we say, oh, well, if I'm going to forgive someone, I just have to act as if it really didn't happen or as if it, um, I'm just going to overlook what they did. That's not forgiveness, okay? To forgive does bring into account that they did wrong you. Even, Gen- even Joseph in the book of Genesis here, if you were to look at Genesis chapter uh, 50, we get the story of as the providence of God brings it to pass here. As he's in the second in command of Egypt, all of a sudden now his brothers need food. There's a famine that went through the land. And now they need food. And sure enough, now he's in command of Egypt, basically. And who do they have to come for to get food? Not knowing it, they're coming to the very brother that they betrayed. What are the odds of that, right? God's destiny, God's providence is pretty funny. The irony is, is, is quite hilarious there. But what does Joseph say when he finally reveals himself to his brothers? At first they don't realize it's Joseph. But then he finally reveals himself to them. And he says this at the end of the book in Genesis chapter 15, verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. You know what Joseph said to them? Listen, you guys did wrong. He didn't overlook it. He didn't just try to sweep it under the rug and act like it wasn't there. No, he did say this. Listen, that wasn't right. It was evil what you did. See, forgiveness doesn't overlook it. It calls it and confronts it as what it is. It is sin. Joseph and his father both called their brother's actions sin. Jesus on the cross, even as he forgave, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even he was said, listen, they've sinned against me, but Lord, they didn't even realize what they're doing. Forgive them. Someone once said it this way. They said, we often confront the sins we should overlook, but we overlook the sins we should confront. And how true that is often in our times. There's things that people do to us that we're not willing to let go of, and yet sometimes we, we will overlook the things that we really should be taking care of. But first of all, forgiveness doesn't overlook the sin. It confronts it, acknowledges the sin. Secondly, forgiveness, it isn't the same thing. Forgiveness isn't the same thing as trust, nor does it mean regaining a fellowship. Forgiveness, forgiving someone doesn't mean that you have to put yourself back into the same place to be hurt again. You know, there are times that there are the people hurt us, either in this day and age in our world, emotionally, physically. Um, mentally, there's times that those type of hurts happen, those betrayals that happen into our life. We can choose to forgive them. It does not always mean that the trust is regained, though. I've heard many people say, oh, will you forgive me? I want you to be able to trust me. That's great. But that trust is gained back. When you wrong somebody, that trust is broken. And it must be regained. The forgiveness can happen automatically but the trust must be worked on. And so as we understand forgiveness, you've got to understand that it's not the same thing as trust. There's a lot of people who throw that out there. Oh, what, you don't trust me? I thought you forgave me. I did. Doesn't mean that I trust you yet, though. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a choice. This is big. This is a big one. If you're waiting to forgive someone who has wronged you in your life, You're waiting to feel ready to forgive them. You never will. Because forgiveness, as we'll see in a little bit, is not a natural response. You will never feel ready to forgive somebody who's wronged you. Because it's such 
It's like a knife that goes to the heart. It's so personal. They've wronged your internal justice system. They've wronged you. And if you're waiting for that choice, you won't. Or if you're waiting for that feeling, you won't. It's a choice. That leads us to the next thing. What is forgiveness? What it is? And forgiveness isn't a process. It's a one-time decision of the will to forgive. Now let me balance this out. It might be a process to get to the point of forgiveness. You might need some time to heal. But there needs to be a time in your life when you say, you know what, I'm not working on forgiving them. I have with, made a decision to forgive them. It's a decision. Joseph in his life obviously had come to that many times. He had many people who hurt him all through his life. Had many people who betrayed him. And Joseph, it didn't take him all his life to forgive them. No, when he met his brothers the second time, he had already forgiven them somehow. Why? Because he had made a decision to say, I forgive. Even, you think he really felt like forgiving his brothers as he's being dragged behind a camel down to Egypt? You think he really felt like forgiving his brothers as he's having to be a slave every day of his life now? You think he felt like forgiving Potiphar and his wife as he's in prison? You think he really felt like forgiving anybody at that point? I doubt it. But he chose to anyways. Now there may be times... You know, the thing is, there may be times you need to f remember that you did forgive. But it's not a process. Is everyone following me here? It's not a process. Martin Luther King said this, he said, forgiveness is not an occasional act, it's a constant attitude. And what that was, that's really good. It's deep. It's not just... An occasional act, oh, I forgive you. No, no. It's the attitude of a heart of a Christian that says, I should have an attitude of forgiveness. And even when that person has wronged me day after day after day, I have that attitude that says, I'm willing to forgive them. You say, why would I do that? Well, we'll get there in a little bit. But it's amazing. It's funny. We know the story of Peter in the Bible. And Peter is talking to Jesus, and he comes up to him. We all know Peter. Peter was a great guy. He, he had some great walks of faith in his life, and we have see some of his low moments in the Bible. And uh, when I look at Peter, we can all see ourselves, can we not? A man who goes up and down and makes some really great, great statements, and the next moment sticks his foot in his mouth. And You know, he was a man. Uh, G, the book of Luke describes Jesus as the perfect man because he was sinless. Well, Peter in my book is, uh, is the... Uh, the perfect example of all of us. You know, we all have been there before. And so Peter, he comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, he's trying to impress him. He says, Hey, if, if somebody hurts me and wrongs me, how many times should I forgive them? How about seven times? I'll forgive him seven times. And I can almost just see Jesus chuckle. And, no, not, not quite seven. How about 70 times seven? Now, he didn't mean, I want you to count to 490. At that point, you're done. You know, you don't have to forgive him. That was the 490th time you have hurt me. Psh, a relationship is over. That's, that's not what he was saying. He's saying again and again and again and again. You say, even if they hurt me every day, even if those words that they throw out of my mouth belittle me, or out of their mouth belittle, belittle me every day, I'm to forgive them again and again. See, forgiveness, it's not a process. It's a one-time decision. By the way, here, this is important. Forgiveness isn't about forgetting. It's choosing not to hold that wrong against them. Uh, that phrase, that phrase, forgive and forget, it doesn't work. It's not true. Unless you have found a great way to forget things, besides your keys. You know, we all forget those. If you've found a great way to forget wrongs and hurts in your life, let me know. I want to know what it is. But I have found very rarely do we ever forget the wrongs that happen to us. Why? God made us that way. We have a great, most of us have a great memory, and especially when it gets personal, they lodge deep in our heart. You'll never forget that. But you can forgive. 
So you can choose to set it down. See the Bible in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17. It says this about Christ with us. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17. It says this, and their sins and iniquities, we looked at this last week, it says our sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You say, well, Jesus forgets our sin. No, he doesn't. It's not like God just woke up one day and said, oh, I don't even remember what you did. I, didn't, I, I forgot what you did. It's no big deal. No, no, no. He says, I choose to remember our sins no more. There's a big difference. It's not like God just said, oh, I forgot what they did and it's not that big of a deal. No, 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 no. He said this, I know that they wronged me, but I forgave them and I'm never going to bring it back up. See, that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is choosing to say, the hurts, the wrongs that have been done to me, yes, they were real, yes, they were hurtful, yes, they have impacted my life, but I'm choosing to lay them down and not remember them anymore. It's as if you have a hurt that is in your life. Imagine this is a hurt that someone does to you. They, they say something. They betray you. They, belittle, they lie about you behind your back. And that hurt now is there. You know what forgiveness is? Bitterness is this. Holding on to it. Bitterness is this. They've hurt me. I want them to know how badly they've hurt me. I'm never going to forget this. I'm never going to let this go. And we may not put it in those words. We'll probably put it a little bit more spiritually. We need to pray for that brother. Because he, he, he just needs help, you know. What really is, is that there's hurts that are in your life that you haven't been willing to let go. For, this is bitterness. Forgiveness says this. These are real hurts. But I'm choosing... To put them down. I'm going to leave them there. Again, can I still see them? Yeah. See, sometimes I have to walk by them every day. And I still see them. Forgiveness is this. I'm never going to pick it back up. I'm going to leave it there. See, it's not a process. It's a decision of the will to say, I forgive even if I don't feel like it. And every time that I see it, I remember, no, 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 no. I already forgave them. We're not going there. See, Satan's real good, though. Every time you see it, though, that wheel, those wheels will get turning. And you'll think, oh, man, I've got I've to pick that back up. They really wronged me. No, 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 no. Forgiveness says it's down. It's covered by the blood. I'm walking away from it. That's forgiveness. It's not forgetting, it's a decision of the will to forgive. By the way, here we go. Forgiveness isn't about others. Forgiveness is for you. See, this is one of the greatest things that you need to understand about forgiveness. Forgiveness really has nothing to do about the other person. It has everything to do about you. See, when I take hurts into my life, when I piled those hurts on, I'm bound up. I can't do anything. Andrew, can I use you real quick? Go ahead and stand up for me. I love being a youth pastor. I got to pick on these guys. You know what, you know what for hurts and bitterness does in my life? It's like this. Okay, hold that. These are hurts that are going into Andrew's life. There's a lot of them. And he's been holding on to them for a while. Okay? Now they're just piling up. By the way, bitterness also always breeds more bitterness. An angry person seems like always has a whole level of anger that's built up. It's not just one thing. It's a whole conglomeration. You know why that is? Because they started out at the bottom with one thing in their life. And they built a wall upon it of unforgiveness in their life. And now there's a bunch of stuff happening. Now he's got a whole bunch of things in his life. You know, all right? Yeah. Good. Now the bitterness is stacking up. And it's just, it's going, it's going up high. It's going, I got more. Stay there. It's, it's up high now. You okay still? 
One more. Not anymore. There. It's, it's piled up. What can Andrew do? Not a lot, right? There's not a lot. Can you tie your shoe for me? No. Are you sure? sure. You want to try? No. Okay. He can't do anything. He can maybe walk. Are you getting tired yet? A little bit? Okay, so stay there. Um, so he can do a lot. He's getting tired. How, how long do you think Andrew can continue to hold this without running out of energy? Uh, evening service. Evening service? I think we can try this. I don't know if I would make it, Andrew, but uh, no. So, hey, you know, he, there's a lot that he's holding into his life right now, isn't it? He's, can I put it this way? He's in bondage, right? He can't be of help to himself. He can't be of help to anyone else. He's pretty much bound up in shackles. See, all those people who have hurt him, it really doesn't affect them all that much if, he doesn't, if he's not forgiving them. It really doesn't. Someone put it this way, uh, bitterness is like this, is drinking poison hoping the other person dies. See, if I hold on to it, it really doesn't affect them one way or the other. What it does is it hurts me. The more that I pile into my life, the more it hurts me physically, emotionally, mentally. Are you still getting tired? Yeah. He's still there. Okay, good. <laughs> it hurts him. He's bound. He can't hold on for much longer. Eventually, I don't want him to collapse. Don't collapse on me, okay? Eventually, it's going to destroy him, right? I'll help you out. You know what forgiveness does? Forgiveness takes all those, lays them all down, Now you feel so much better, don't you? You're free. See, he's out of bondage. He's able to do what he could not do before. For himself, for his family. See, bitterness will destroy, whereas forgiveness releases us to enable us to be able to show the grace of God to other people in our life. It's not about you, it's about others. Or I'm sorry, it's not about others, it's about you. Forgiveness is this, it's to set a prisoner free only to realize that the prisoner was you. That's what forgiveness is. The more that I build up that wall, you're like, oh, there's a hurt there. And there's a hurt there. And, and folks, I'm not making light of the hurts and the wrongs that have happened in our lives. Please don't misunderstand me. Because I know those go deep. And those are real. And those hurt. And they'll never be the same for some of those hurts that happen. But you have a choice. Whether you're going to let that make you bitter and take you down a path of destruction. Or you have a choice of whether to release them in your mind to say, you know what? I'm setting this down. In Micah chapter 7 verse 11 it says this. I'm going to read you this verse here. This is talking about, about the Lord here. Chapter 7, verse 11. Um, that wasn't the one I needed. Give me one second. Where did it go here? Verse 18, there it is. Chapter 7, verse 18, it says this. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Who is a God like unto God? That he doesn't use, it's interesting, he doesn't use the word forgives. He said pardons. We know about that. We have here in our country the presidential pardon, right? Where he can come and say, hey, I am pardoning this man. I'm releasing him. You know what the interesting thing is? A lot of those guys are guilty of something. It's not like he comes and says, oh, this was just a mistake. You weren't really guilty about it. I'm going to let you go. No, no, no. Most of the time it's this. I am knowing that you're guilty and I'm pardoning you for it. You know, that's what God does to us. He says, I know that you're guilty. And I'm still letting you walk away free. That's what forgiveness is. To say this, I know you've hurt me. I know you have wronged me. I'm releasing you. 
I'm pardoning you. See, it's not about others, it's about you. Wow, we could go and talk about why should I forgive? Well, I think we all know it. Christ forgave us, didn't he? It's interesting that not only is it commanded, Ephesians 4, 32, uh, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, loving, uh, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. It's commanded, but it's also just the, the next thing that is expected of us because of what Christ did for us. Hey, if Christ forgave us, who are we to say that we can never forgive somebody else? Can I just help you out here? Would you turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15? Say, Brother Matt, why is this so important? Why is this so important in my life? Hebrews 12. Verse 15, it says this, looking diligently, in other words, being watchful, being on the, uh, being observant, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You say, Brother Matt, why is it so important that I, as a Christian, forgive those around me? Because Bitterness doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone else around you. Bitterness will destroy your family. It'll destroy your homes. It'll destroy your marriages. It'll destroy your relationships with your children. It'll destroy your relationships at work. It'll destroy churches. See, that root of bitterness, sometimes that root of bitterness, here's how I view this passage. I don't always think it's possible to get the root out. Because that root, I view that root as the hurt that is in our life. You know what sometimes happens? That root, it springs up, it starts growing, and you see the produce of it. He says, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you. Our job is not to necessarily, we can't take out the hurts of our life. What we can do is clip them back down. We can make sure that they're not showing, that there's no bitterness exhibiting itself. We can show, can I put it this way, forgiveness. If you don't, it'll destroy it. Many will be defiled. I can't tell you how many people I've seen who have gotten bitter, angry about something, and they have become bitter. They're not willing to talk about it with anyone. And then sure enough, there's someone else all of a sudden being affected by that bitterness. And you can tell me all day that, oh, no, it won't affect me. That, that'll never bother me. I, that won't, I, you know, we're too strong. You hang out with bitterness and bitter people, you will become bitter. I guarantee it. I know I'm a young whippersnapper, but I've seen it already, okay? It will happen, mark my words. It'll defile people. It'll destroy your marriage if you don't forgive. Hey, ladies, can I help you out? Sometimes us men... You know, we, we're unobservant. We don't, we don't treat our wives like we ought to. There are some times we allow other things in our lives to take priority over our families. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we're not the leaders that we ought to be. Sometimes we say things in anger that we should never have said. Can I help you out? We're human and we make mistakes. You want to know one of the greatest things that will help your marriage and your family is to learn how to forgive. If you let those things pile up in your life and you hold on to them, you'll look back years later, you almost won't even know how to get rid of it all because it just piles up and it's a giant wall now. You know what? Learn to forgive. You say, but Brother Matt, that was hurtful. He should never have said that. He should have been the leader that he was supposed to be. Yes, yes, he should have. And the Lord will take care of that. Your responsibility is to forgive, though. Men, your wives are never wrong, so we don't even need to go there, right? 
hey, sometimes, sometimes they say things that they shouldn't say. Maybe sometimes they don't show you the respect you think you deserve. You know what? They're human too and they make mistakes. Learn to forgive. Hey, teenagers, kids, you know what? Your parents, they're humans too. I know you may question that sometimes, but they are human and they make mistakes. And sometimes they may discipline you the wrong way or maybe you don't agree with how they do it or maybe that you think they should give you more freedom or maybe they discipline you for something your brother did, you know? Sometimes they make mistakes. Have you learned to forgive them? Hey, if you don't, it will defile, it will destroy your family. Not only will it destroy others around you, the Bible says, verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. It's interesting that all of a sudden the writer of Hebrew brings Esau into this discussion of forgiveness. You know what happened with Esau? There were some real hurts and wrongs that happened in his life. He chose to hold on to them, and he got bitter. You know what happened to him in the end? He became a profane person and a fornicator. Mark my words, bitterness will always lead you down that path. It'll lead you down a path to where someday you come and say, I don't even believe that there is a God. And I know folks to this day who are that, who are that way today, who used to be in a Bible college, who used to serve God. Some things happened in their life. They got bitter. And today they say, I don't believe there is a God. What was it? It was bitterness. Led them down a path. By the way, it also led them down the path of fornication. They almost go hand in hand. It will destroy everything. You say, it's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is. It will destroy everything it touches. You say, Brother Matt, though, how do I forgive? That's where the, really the rubber meets the road, isn't it? We probably all know that we ought to. But you say, Brother Matt, it's so hard. Anyone there with me? Isn't it a lot easier said than done? Let's just be honest. You know why that is? I said it at the beginning, because it is not a natural response. There's nothing inside of this old, dirty, wicked sinner that makes me want to forgive someone who's hurt me. It takes the grace of God in your life. Oswald Chambers said it this way. He said, we talk glibly about forgiving when we have never been injured. But when we, have, when we are injured, we know it is not possible, apart from God's grace, for one human to forgive another. Hey, can I help you out? Without God's power in your life, you can't forgive somebody. You've got to be willing to come before God and say, God, that hurt, that wrong, I don't feel like doing it, but God, would you help me? God, you forgave me, and I need your help to forgive that person. And that miraculous power of God to lay that burden down and walk away. That's a miracle. And anyone here today who's ever had to forgive somebody knows what we're talking about. Because you can't do it. You've got to have God's grace flowing through. You know what grace is? Grace is simply God doing what you cannot do. And you can't forgive. But Christ can. And Christ can forgive through me if I let him. See, that's how I forgive. I give it to God. I walk away. And this is important. I never bring it back up. See, sometimes you have to talk it through with people to forgive. Sometimes you do. The Bible even talks about in Matthew chapter 18, talks about uh, the fact this is talking really about church discipline, but he says, hey, if your brother has offended you, you need to go to him and try to work it out. The principle is, the, the, the passage about church discipline, but really the principle is the same. 
If you have something that you believe they have done against you, you need to go talk with them. Try to work it out. But you know that sometimes talking it out doesn't always work. And sometimes those folks will never understand that they've hurt you. And sometimes those folks will never agree that they've hurt you. You say, oh, well, I, I can't forgive them until they agree that they've hurt me. No, 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 no. You do what you can, and then you forgive and you leave the rest up to God. That's how I forgive. And then like Joseph did, if possible, find ways to do good to those who have hurt you. That's a bigger great work of grace of God in your life. To show kindness to those who have betrayed you. Sometimes that's not possible. But there are times where it is. And Joseph, he had every reason, every right, we could say, he had every right to throw his brothers in jail, right? He could have killed them, and we would have all been like, oh, that was a great ending to that story. They deserve that. No, 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 no. He, he fed them. He gave them more than they asked for. He protected them. He provided for them. Why? Because... He knew that God had allowed it to happen in his life. You say, yo, you mean that God causes hurts and betrayals in my life? No, no, no. God doesn't cause them, but he will use them. Think about it this way. Joseph's destiny, how did he get there? Through a lot of hurts and betrayals. You say, oh, so God caused all those to happen so he could have the destiny. No, no, no. God used them all to accomplish Joseph's destiny in his life, though. Why? Because Joseph responded correctly. Back here in just a couple years ago, 2015 of June 17th, Dylan Roof walked into Emmanuel AME Episcopal Church down in Charleston, South Carolina. How many are remembering the story now? He walked in there and brutally murdered nine people there who were attending a prayer service including the pastor. You think about all the families that were forever changed that day. The shock that gripped our nation. The hurt that would never go away because of one man's actions. And yet one by one, as those who chose to speak at a bond hearing, they didn't turn to anger. Rather, while he remained impassive and showing no remorse, they offered him forgiveness. Nadine Collier, the daughter of 70-year-old Ethel Lance, who had been shot and killed, said this. She said, I forgive you. You took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never, ever hold her again. But I forgive you. That's the work of God's grace in someone's life. Charles Spurgeon said this, to be forgiven is such sweetness the honey is tasteless in comparison with it. But yet there is one thing sweeter still, and that is to forgive. In June of 2009, Dr. Chuck Sandstrom, he was overseeing the removal of an unregistered vehicle from a rental property he owned in Akron, Ohio. When Michael Ayers, the owner of the car, confronted him, enraged, Ayers punched Dr. Sandstrom, whose head snapped back, colliding with a brick wall behind him. Sandstrom, he suffered a traumatic brain injury and continues to feel the effects of that punch to this day. However, during Ayer's trial, Sandstrom and his wife chose to join the defense, petitioning a reduced sentence and access to treatment, work, and school during the man's jail time. Of his choice to forgive, Sandstrom said this. He said, people think that we're special to have forgiven this man, but trust me, my wife and I, are not abnormally good people. What is true, however, is that the path of forgiveness can take ordinary people on an extraordinary journey. And how true that is. Friends, what's in your life today? What hurts, what betrayals have taken place that you say, I can't let this go? Can I help you out? That's a lie of the devil. You can, with God's grace, lay it down. And instead of being bound, you can find the freedom of forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this message. I ask that you would continue to work in our hearts and our minds. Thank you for all those who were able to be here today. 
Lord, I pray that as we finish up and we wrap up, that, Lord, you would, please, if there's anyone who needs to deal with you with some areas of our life, that they would take this time to lay down some burdens. I want to give us all an opportunity to do that today. This is a message that I believe requires a response from our heart. And so I'm going to ask that, would you stand with me here today? With your head bowed, your eyes still closed, go ahead and stand to your feet.